Anyway, just moving on. I've entitled the talk Flogging a Dead Horse. Uh, I think that um, we really are flogging a dead horse in this. Um, the Northern Territory does face economic challenges and gas and LNG have been touted as a saviour, but the gas industry isn't investing. It's not investing. Uh, and the gas fired recovery is really just an exercise in subsidy harvesting. Uh, they've got their hand out at every opportunity. Um, any industry is economic with enough government support. So can the gas fired recovery occur? Well, certainly a lot of money can be spent on trying to make it occur. Uh, gas is being overtaken globally by renewables and no longer serves as a transition fuel. And gas expansion comes at a cost to agriculture. So um, look, the last six weeks have been pretty incredible um, in terms of the changes that we've seen. Um, Australia's three largest LNG export markets are Japan, China, and South Korea in that order. Um, all have gone net zero by mid-century. Um, China's uh, has gone mid, mid net zero by 2060. Um, this in effect means that all international gas demand forecasts done just last month are out of date. Um, and gas in Australia will be redirected from international markets into the domestic market over time. Uh, the presidential election in the US has been won by Biden, apparently, um, hopefully. Um, <laughs> You never know with the US, but it appears to have been won by Biden. And the Democrats are also taking the US to net zero. Um, the EU is looking at putting in, in carbon border adjustment mechanism from 2023. That is a carbon tariff. A carbon tariff is essentially a carbon tax uh, low, uh, levied by a foreign government. Uh, so it has all the disadvantages of a carbon tax and none of the advantages, um, essentially. Uh, it means that uh, we'd be paying a carbon tax, but uh, the revenue would be collected by foreign governments. Uh, San Francisco has banned fossil gas in new buildings from next year. Victoria's announced a big battery. AGL's announced a big battery. Uh, the Grattan Institute, which is a, uh, what you'd call a conservative think tank, it lists as its members as sponsors uh, Woodside Petroleum, for example, uh, and the Australian government was one of the founders of the Grattan Institute. Uh, they wrote a report written by uh, Tony Wood, who is an ex-Origin employee, and that report was titled Flame Out, the Future of Natural Gas. And I'll quote directly from the report because it's important uh, what they're saying. They're saying that this report confronts the uncomfortable truth that natural gas is in decline in Australia. The consequences of that reality may be painful for some in the short term, but neither wishful thinking nor denial will serve us well. The only rational approach for governments, the energy industry and its customers is to begin planning for a future without natural gas, or at least with a substantially reduced role for natural gas. So the conservative think tank, uh, the Grattan Institute is, is, is saying that gas is finished as a fuel in, in the global economy. Uh, if we have a look, the Victorian government came out with major energy efficiency um, initiatives, spending you know, $800 million. Uh, the effect of these will be to lower demand for all energy, including gas. Um, they'll be switching a lot of the gas heaters out for more efficient heat pumps, which are electric powered. Uh, they'll be switching, switching out um, gas fired um, ovens and stoves for electric ones. So we're gonna see a significant reduction in gas demand in Victoria. Um, the household is an important area in Victoria for gas consumption. Uh, historically, with cheap gas out of the Bass Strait, it was encouraged by government to, to, to make your ga uh, households have gas. And so 60% uh, of Victorian consumption is actually in the house. Uh, over 
renewables globally are overwhelming fossil fuel and nuclear. Um, you know, we've seen a massive expansion in, in uh, renewables and we're seeing a contraction in fossil fuel and nuclear power. What is, there are a couple of interesting things. Both these graphs are on the same scale for a start. And the second interesting thing is that um, uh, nuclear is really not a feature in the global uh, electricity production uh, in terms of new builds. It really is that tiny little orange line down the bottom of the graph. So for all the nuclear fans out there, it, it's not really figuring in, in the global energy system. The other point to note is if you look back at 2001, many more gas plants were being built than coal plants. In 2019, that wasn't true. So gas serving as a transition fuel just simply isn't correct. It, it hasn't served that role. Uh, what we're seeing uh, in the US is a collapse of the fracking industry. I, I think that's the correct term, is a collapse. Uh, the number of operating drill rigs have fallen 60% in the last 12 months. What that means going forward is you're going to see a collapse in production. Shale, shale uh, gas relies on continually drilling uh, to top up your reserves because the wells deplete very quickly. And so we've seen this massive collapse in, in, in operating drill rigs, and that means we're going to see um, uh, a collapse in production in, in about a year to 18 months' time. T total oil and gas um, bankruptcies um, have accelerated, and so far this year, $53 billion in debt has been restructured. That's a pretty big number. Uh, we're seeing the global gas glut extend beyond 2028. Um, you know, we, we're, there's quite massive overcapacity at the moment in LNG. Um, Origin has slashed its drilling program in Australia. Um, the APLNG joint venture with Noco Phillips and Sinopec has only drilled 23 wells this year compared with 95 at the same time last year. Um, that's a 76% fall. So we're seeing similar falls in drilling in Australia to those in, in, in the US, uh, which will obviously also flow through to production. So these guys are cutting production, they're sacking workers, and they're telling us they're going to be the engine for economic growth. That doesn't add up. If you're going to stimulate economic growth, you should be investing, you should be drilling more wells, and you should be employing more people, and they're doing the reverse. Uh, a third of the US shale industry is near technical insolvency, according to Deloitte, and um, it's never made any money in the past 10 years. You know, Aoife came out with a paper saying this um, a couple of years ago now, that the uh, fracking industry in the US basically hasn't been profitable for the last 10 years. Um, you know, you, we, we copped some criticism and now Deloitte's are coming out with uh, the same conclusion, essentially. Uh, into this really poor gas market, we're seeing a massive expansion to come out of Qatar. They're looking at, um, increasing production by 64% by 2027. Qatar is, is the, well, was last year the world's largest um, LNG exporter. Um, it's now the second largest compared to Australia, but you know, it's right up there with Australia. We're, we're, we're pretty neck and neck as the world's largest um, exporters. And they're looking at this massive uh, expansion in production. They're, they're cutting the price to do it by about 22% to try and secure new customers. Why are they doing it? It's very simple. Qatar is pretty much a one trick pony as an economy. It's got gas or gas. Um, and um, it's a very low cost producer, so they can expand and make money. Unlike Australia, we're not as low cost as Qatar. Actually, no one globally is as low cost as Qatar is. Um, the other thing is, is that the north field that they're looking at developing is the same field as Iran's south field. It's, it's just got an artificial line through it called a border. It's the same gas field. And Iran have gone on and developed their half of the field. So Qatar are forced into developing their part, otherwise they miss out on the gas. Iran will pump it all out. 
Um, this is just a quick graph on Australian domestic consumption. It's down 21% since 2014. So far from being this growing industry that's stimulating the economy, it's been contracting now for the last six years and will contract, I, I think, substantially more than the AMO were, were predicting um, uh, just last year. Um, investments all but cease, as I've said, uh, we don't need to go into that anymore. There are $11 billion of gas assets for sale at the moment in Australia. That's just what I actually publicly know about. Obviously, there'd be a lot more on the grey market. Um, uh, ExxonMobil has actually pulled the sale of its $3 billion gas, gas trade assets uh, because it failed to find a buyer. Um, the, there isn't a lot of capacity to buy all these things that for sale, are for sale at the moment. Uh, Origin Energy is looking to farm out part of its Beetaloo um, Basin in the Northern Territory. There kind of isn't a lot of appetite for that sort of thing at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see how they go. Uh, the Australian gas industry has written off $25 billion in the first six months of 2020. Internationally, Exxon has written off $20 billion just in the fourth quarter. So we've got uh, massive uh, write-offs occurring all around the world, uh, impairing the, the, the uh, industry's ability to invest. Uh, the three fracking companies, three big ones that head up the three consortium at Gladstone, at Santos, Origin and Shell, um, they've written off uh, over $24 billion since 2014 on their failed East Coast CSG to LNG ventures. Uh, so, you know, we're really not seeing gas as a transition fuel. Uh, gas for gas powered generation usage has fallen 59% since 2014. Um, that's why renewable energy has grown strongly to, to now account for, for about 25% of the total generation in, in the national electricity market. Now it's got to 25%, um, renewable energy will just keep growing. Uh, in terms of capacity. We've seen major government pro, uh, programs in both um, uh, New South Wales and Victoria to stimulate renewable energy in the electricity system. So we're gonna see a lot more of that going forward. Um, Look, the National COVID Commission and its offshoot, the Northern Territory, one that just released its report this, this week, uh, both of them under, you know, with, with Andrew Liveris being a, a key player in them, uh, are, are both looking at substantial, you know, giving out substantial government subsidies to the gas industry. Uh, I, I just don't think that's a credible way to stimulate the economy. Importantly, when we look at these net zero commitments by our state governments all around Australia and our offshore export markets, uh, the net zero by 2050, between 2020 and 2030, we have to decrease fossil fuel production by 6% per annum. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot. When you start compounding 6% per annum every year, we've got to decrease production by that amount, that's an awfully big cut in coal and gas and oil and, you know, other things that we burn production. Uh, so, so we need to see, uh, at the moment, globally, we're looking at around 2% increases everyone's planning. Um, in Australia, obviously, that's much larger. We have very big expansions going on on the Northwest Shelf, in, you know, as as you know, in the Northern Territory, in Queensland, in New South Wales, um, we have very big expansions going on in, in fossil fuel production. Um, so it's entirely inconsistent with any of these net zero policies. And the key point here is it doesn't really matter what anyone thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what Scott Morrison thinks. It doesn't matter what Angus Taylor thinks. It doesn't matter what the Labor Party thinks about all this. Uh, it's our customers that matter, uh, and we have to listen to our customers. And our customers are saying they don't want the product. And if 
if we're so stupid that we can't actually understand that and adapt to the new normal now, which is declining markets for fossil fuels. Uh, there was this fascinating uh, study done by the AFI um, that basically showed that 1.8 jobs were lost in the ag sector for every job gained in the gas sector. Uh, so, you know, we've got to look, the Northern Territory does have a large cattle industry and obviously we're going to see a lot of jobs lost in that industry if the gas industry goes ahead. Uh, so that's really not a great thing. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the groundwater impacts that you all know about, but I, I love this source. This is from the Office of Groundwater Impact Assessment, which is part of the Department of Natural Resources um, in, in, in Queensland. And they say that in just one CSG base in Queensland, the Surat Basin, 122 bores have run dry as a result of CSG activities and are subject to make good arrangements. They're predicting that uh, 571 bores will run dry over the life of the Surat Basin. Uh, and that's obviously higher than the previous estimate. That estimate keeps creeping up uh, of the number of bores that are both affected or you know, currently affected or, or will run dry. The, the numbers keep going up. And we are in the early days still of this industry on the east coast of Australia. Uh, you know, it's only been operating really at a you know, at scale since 2014. And so we're going to see substantial, substantial effects on, on other parts of the economy. So um, anyway, that ends my um, talk. Uh, thank you very much.